on to now to our next um, session and its presentation from um, Joanna Tano. Is that right? Tano? That is right. Yeah. <laughs> Head you. of Research at Columbia Fred Needle Real Estate and Daniel Walsgrove, uh, Deputy Fund Manager at Columbia Fred Needle as well. Perfect. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. Hopefully, everyone can hear me. Um, Quick introduction. Um, you might have been expecting our colleague Richard Kirby. Sadly, he couldn't join us today. So you've got myself and you've got um, Dan. And we're going to talk to you about the sort of diversification benefits within a real estate portfolio. Um, so um, let's, uh, is it that one? There we go. Very quickly, again, because I'm not sure if you were expecting us or not. Uh, I'm Joanna Tano. I look after the um, real estate research team for Columbia Threadneedles um, real estate business across Europe. Uh, this is my colleague Dan, who's going to join us as well. Do you want to yeah, get Dan Walsgrove. I'm the deputy fund manager on Balanced Commercial Property Trust and CC Property Trust, which are two diversified groups that we run out. Perfect. Um, sorry about this. Compliance told me I have to put it up, so I have. Um, you've probably been very familiar with all these kind of caveats, so um, I won't dwell on the slide. But what I'm going to um, talk you through, really, from a research perspective, is more about the theory of how we look at diversification diversification in real estate and why we do that. Um, and then I'm gonna let Dan bring it to life really with some examples of how he uses that within his funds. So probably a bit of an odd slide to put up first, you might think, but actually um, my belief is understanding and disaggregating some of those really big trends that are happening around us and the structural drivers um, are really important to kind of comprehending um, how we interact with bricks and mortar, how we, work, where we work, how we shop, how we play and how we live. Um, and I think crucially how those things are actually changing over time as well um, is also pretty important. So all of those inform our investment decisions, um, both in building our portfolios and in tilting our portfolios as well over time and after all real estate, long term, long term investment. So if we just go quickly around the circle, um, taking demographics, a couple of examples, people are living longer, there's a larger proportion of the population over 65, and that is increasing actually quite at quite a dramatic rate. Um, and real estate can sort of help support those needs through, for example, senior living. Um, likewise, quite a few people opting out of home ownership. It's just so expensive now. Um, and some, it's just a cultural shift. They just prefer to rent properties instead. And again, those demographic drivers help us inform decisions about whether to go into the living sector or out of the living sector. Um, infrastructure, it's new developments, redevelopments, expansions, um, project uh, extension plans, etc., have the potential to sort of open up new areas um, or perhaps open up those areas that we might have forgotten in the past. Um, and again, creating that, that infrastructure that comes with it. Where do we live? Where do we shop? How do we play? How do we do all of those things in the built environment? And I don't think it's just about the type of real estate. It's where that real estate is as well. So I think geographically makes um, it's something that we look at down. We'll pick up on that later. Um, technology, I think it's one of the fastest disruptors in terms of real estate uh, and the awareness and the adoption of it um, is really critical in terms of future proofing um, assets and, and importantly preserving and creating that value going forwards as well. So not a question to answer now, but for example, what is the impact of driverless cars going to do? Which sectors is it going to affect most? Which sectors will be winners? Which sectors will be losers? Um, and those are sort of the questions that we continuously ask. Um, moving on to ESG, or maybe livability is a better word. Um, the ability to deliver energy efficient um, buildings, reduce that carbon footprint and have a social impact will again differ across sectors. You're not going to get it all from one sector. And so again, ESG has a role to play in creating that long term kind of value in the physical asset and therefore across the portfolio. Um, Urbanisation, okay, it's really as people move into conurbations, that's where the infrastructure is. So there is a um, sort of inward migration back into cities and real estate will meet and will help kind of deliver that demand for people who need to work and live there, et cetera. Um, you know, urban logistics is a good example of how people's behavior changes that impacts real estate. That wasn't even a thing five years ago, arguably, definitely not 10 years ago. It wasn't something we talked about. So it definitely wasn't something we invested in and definitely wasn't something we put into our portfolios. Um, so all of these themes, I mean, there are others. They help us drive our decisions. That's, that's kind of the key message there. If we go on to the next slide, what we then do in terms of 
real estate, we distill all of that and look at how individual sectors and subsectors can actually um, show us where the risks and where the opportunities are and how potentially each of those can be harnessed across a diversified portfolio. Um, and I think it's almost pointing out the within each sector what's good and what's bad about it. Um, this is a snapshot in time. It, it changes. That's the key thing to say. It is a snapshot in time. But understanding the resilience of each individual sector that's on here, again, there are others, um, that, and knowing that they don't all act and react to the same, potentially the same circumstance and the same external factor. And again, that allows us to build in some resilience into our portfolios. And we look at it across sectors because we think where there are some winners, there are some losers as well. It's slightly like gambling, I think. Not that I'm a gambler, but I think it, there are winners and losers. Um, so if we take an example, we look at the latest uh, health crisis, the same, the same event, so COVID, the same event impacted different speeds all of these sectors at different speeds, there were winners, there were losers. And so arguably, overexposing yourself to one sector is potentially, um, can be potentially detrimental because you've got the highs and the lows and the swings across each of the sectors. Um, retail is a good example, um, completely shut down through COVID, as did pretty much everything. But as it began to open up, retail warehousing really, because it serviced that, that um, need for sort of the essential retail part, um, that opened up first. Um, in my opinion, that was more of a winner than a loser. Shopping centers, however, have really struggled and they've continued to struggle since. So you can see how different sectors have obviously the different risks um, associated with them. Um, so we move on to the next slide. This is um, MSCI's annual um, index. This is their universe. Um, this is across the last 40 years. Uh, it's about in 2022, it's 990 billion worth of, of uh, AUM. It's about 264 assets, uh, sorry, portfolios and about 11,000 properties sitting within this index. And the reason, so it's quite, it's quite bulky. Uh, and the reason I put this up is because I think um, it really illustrates what I've been trying to say on the last couple of slides about real estate. It changes over time. You've had, had some sectors that were in favor that that has changed now and vice versa so if you look at the office sector which is the sort of bright blue um that was about 54 55 percent of the total index about 40 years ago that's now dropped way down to um 20 25 uh, or so um no surprise you know hybrid working um it was around it was around before covid covid accelerated the trend but it was around um so you know if you were just in the office sector potentially potentially you have a lot of overexposure to that sector now where we, we are structurally seeing a change in demand. We will not have the same demand in the office sector as we've had in the past. So structurally things are changing. Um, I think industrial is a really good example. It's kind of come into its own in the last few years. So it was 15% a couple of years ago, um, sorry, at the beginning of the index, unloved, kind of unwanted, a bit boring. It was there because we needed it to be there, not because it we sort of thought it was nice and shiny and really wanted to invest in any great way into it. Um, that's doubled. It's now about 30% of the index. Um, and again, that was pre-COVID. It has been accelerated by COVID. Um, but what it demonstrates really is that changes in technology, human behavior, political events such as Brexit, the war in Ukraine and Russia, all influence how different sectors move at different times. And I think that's the important thing is they're trying to cut out the sort of the volatility of one particular sector and mitigate those risks by looking across different sectors and how they act and react to things. Um, so I think one of the things that we continuously ask ourselves and across the business is how do we cut through the volatility? How do we capture the upside potential, minimize the downside risk? And in our view, diversifying across portfolios can kind of do those things. So if you diversify the portfolio against different sectors, you, you can capture the, the highs in effect and sort of minimize, minimize the lows. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, this chart, sorry, it's a little bit busy, but basically it shows you um, total returns by sector and by all property. And then we just average that across time. And really what stands out is the volatility. If you look around 2022, 2023 at the end, you can automatically see the lines are kind of going all over the place. So again, looking at industrials, it's a, it's a sector that's quite easy to pick on at the moment. It had huge upswings, but it had huge downswings as well. Um, similar story with retail across the last four or five years. You know, there's been uh, peaks and troughs across it. So again, overexposure to one single sector kind of 
you are going to be exposed to those highs and lows. You can't sort of capture any upside from another sector that's balancing out in your portfolio. Um, I think as well, tilting a single sector portfolio is quite difficult because you have to tend to tilt the whole portfolio at the same time. If it's all industrial, you're going to want to probably do the same thing at the same time. Whereas if you've got some industrial and some retail, you can balance out what you're trying to do with those different sectors at the same time within your portfolio. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say on that side was just to show you the volatility in a single sector. Um, the next slide, this really shows you, again, the numbers don't really matter. It's more just the, the swings in the capital movement. So 2008, 2009, you saw some downswings. So you've got the, the gray bars as your capital return. And on the right hand side, again, 20, 2022 and 23, they've gone up and down. What's important from here and my key takeaway is that the blue bar has been pretty stable. So that's income. So that's been pretty, give or take, pretty stable across the last, you know, however long the graph is from 2006. Um, and it's the main, one of the main factors behind income is vacancy, which is on the next graph. So what this shows you is sector vacancy against all property vacancy and all income return. So the two lines, they're roughly stable. Um, so vacancy hasn't really picked up after the GFC, um, the global financial crisis. So, um, but what we have seen is really big variances again between sectors. Um, on the right hand side, you can see we've got in the light blue, there's offices, um, which really have risen up to 15%. Um, we've got industrials that are around about 6%. Um, even in industrials, I think at a quality level, that's probably dropped to below 3%. So you've got squeezed vacancy, you don't have much coming through in the pipeline, and that's producing your income. Um, even in offices, I mean, there is a place for offices, um, Dan will come on to that, but even at 15%, you, as a tenant, you still have a bit more wiggle room in how much you can push on your, on, your, on, your, on your income and what you're prepared to pay for your rent. It's a bit harder when the total vacancy of the country in industrials is 3%. So that's, the, so that's why income is, is long-term and quite important. But again, you need the diversification across the different sectors. We can pick up on retail. The vacancy in shopping centres is about 18, 20 percent uh, across the UK. Retail warehousing, which we saw from previous slides, is doing much, much better. Um, probably the, the sweetheart of retail, so to speak, at least for now. And the vacancy there is about five or six percent. So it's much, much lower. So you can really drive in a lot more income through there as well. So, again, it's that balancing act um, and counterbalancing the risks with the, um, with the kind of fundamentals that are kind of sitting behind each individual sector. What we also do is, we this is as it stands now, but what we also try and do is look at vacancy going forwards, look at pipeline going forwards, and try and understand where we think there might be advantages um, or disadvantages on the income side as well. So if we think vacancy is suddenly going to shoot up because there's loads of planning coming through in the City of London offices, for example, we, we may tilt the portfolio. But if we were just a single office um, strategy, that would be a bit, that would be a lot harder. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, so really, aside from portfolio returns, diversification can help address a variety of different factors within the investment environment. Um, and they're often out of our control, but there's something we should definitely be aware of because they have a direct impact on real estate. So whilst we can't control them, if we're aware of them and we know about them, then that definitely helps. And it will impact, again, different sectors at different times. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, and I'm just going to pick up on a few. So, for example, in terms of ESG um, and holding holding um, sort of holdings across the portfolio, offices, for example, pretty high energy and use of, in, of energy, quite high intensity there in a way that, for example, real, um, retail warehousing or logistics or self-storage just isn't. Um, so you can see how diversification can sort of ease that that uh, energy intensity, intensity, that's not a word, sorry, you know what I mean, across the portfolio. Um, so you can hold critical high uses, so food storage, for example, but at the same time, you can have lower intensity assets, so you can hold retail warehousing. So again, it's that balancing act across, across the portfolio. Um, I personally think the social agenda is quite a uh, something I'm quite keen on. Um, I think it's really important, and I think it's also much easier to deliver across a mixed portfolio particularly if you've got some resi in there. I mean, imagine going to a development where you can put on, I don't know, sake of argument, coronation party for the tenants. You know, you're trying to do something socially. Whereas if you've got um, an automated uh, logistics shed in the middle of nowhere, that's a little bit harder when the person goes in to make sure the tech works. It's much easier to deliver a social strategy 
um, across uh, there are some sectors that just allow for more of that social um, interaction. So again, it's it's the balancing act. Um, I think on the levelling up agenda, it, I've talked a lot about sector challenges and opportunities. Dan's going to pick up on actual geographically as well. You can diversify geographically and it's an important thing. So I won't labour really too much on that point. I think um, one key, for example, regulatory point that we are we very much look at because it will impact heavily and has already done so is around EPCs. So EPC, particularly in the resi market, it's you have to have an, an EPC of an E or higher to let your property since 2020. Um, that's going to change for new leases in 2025. That has to be a C and from existing leases, that's going to move to C in 2028. Now what that is doing is there's a lot of private landlords putting their properties back onto the market because they don't want to take the capex. They have zero interest in trying to bring their properties up. It's actually more expensive than I think most people realise. Um, and what we're seeing is there's a gap now in the market for proper, properly managed, should I say, um, residential um, assets in a chronically undersupplied sector. So that's really come about because of this change in regulation. So it's something we can't control, but we're monitoring it. And we see that now as a gap that we can possibly fill as we try and maybe tilt um, portfolios towards having a bit more of an alternative weighting. Um, student visas, again, just picking up one on the, on the bottom uh, chunk. It's quite interesting. Home office is, uh, or there's rhetoric around the home office trying to cut back on immigration in terms of overseas students bringing their families with them. Now, potentially, potentially, that might turn some students away from wanting to come and, and um, sort of study in the UK. Now, we don't know the answer to the next question is, but what impact is that going to have on purpose-built student accommodation? We don't know the answer yet. So I think kind of almost in conclusion from my section is there are a myriad of factors, myriad of factors, many more than what's in the last few slides that you've seen. But they, you know, they range from global thematics to regulation to human behavior and all of that impacts um, on, on how we interact with, with real estate. Um, and so I think they interact at different times and at different speeds and their outcome is also very different. So Again, I think that supports the case for having a diversified portfolio in terms of real estate, because you can counterbalance um, what's happening in one sector and, and what's happening in another. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going to leave my section. Hopefully that's given you a bit of an overview as to how and why we look at different sectors and um, what the impacts are and how we try to capture them again. Some of that are out of our control and others within our control. Um, and I'll leave you with Dan, who's going to give you some examples of how we put this kind of theory into, into practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna. Um, hi, everyone. I just thought it'd be useful to kind of take the theory that Joanna's already outlined and bring it back to, to an example. I've put up here the composition of Balanced Commercial Property Trust. So this is a diversified commercial REIT run by Richard Kirby, who and you were expecting to see today, but unfortunately she can't be with us. And I think it outlines the benefits of diversification quite well. Um, so running a diversified model rather than a single strategy or some sort of index tracker, it allows you to kind of pick your moments to go in and out of sectors based on whatever the kind of underlying fundamentals or, dy or dynamics are and, and what they're doing at that particular moment in time. And then you can take a little bit of benchmark risk to hopefully deliver a bit of outperformance for your, uh, for your investors. So here you can see on the left, we've got the regional allocation. So this fund has got a, uh, a conviction to the southeast and also primarily to London. Um, now, the southeast is the UK's primary economic driver. So that means you tend to get strong uh, residual values, strong capital resilience. But that comes at a cost in that the yields are much tighter in the southeast than they are more regionally. So when you look regionally, you can find assets which don't necessarily compromise on the quality of those buildings, but they give you a bit of a yield advantage. Uh, maybe comes with a little less capital resilience. But the key is just looking at what's moving, what's moving underneath those uh, those regions, making sure you've got your uh, your allocations right. And something you might look at, as Jan's already mentioned, was the levelling up agenda. When you're looking at your regional exposures, where you want, what cities you want to be in, and so all of that's changing all the time. And that's where you can can kind of tweak it around the edges. Uh, on the right, you've got the uh, portfolio composition in terms of your sectors. So you can see it's pretty well balanced between industrial offices, retail, all about 30%. And then you've got about 10% in alternatives. And if you go back two years or so, this was 20% industrial and 40% offices. But the performance outlook were very different between the two. 
Um, so there was a capital reallocation strategy got put in place to allocate towards industrials at the expense of, of the offices. And obviously industrials are in a really strong drive of capital growth. But the flip side of that is that your yields are being compressed. So the more you put into industrials, your income is going to suffer at the portfolio level. And if you're in a single strategy, then really your, your options are primarily going up the risk curve to try and deliver that, that income. But in a diversified portfolio, you can rely on something like your alternatives exposure or your retail exposure to boost your, uh, to boost your income profile. This next slide just sets out uh, essentially what, was, what the different sectors have done over the last 15 years. Uh, it's, me it's measuring returns uh, against the variability of those returns from, from the average. So you've got the, the MSCI index in the middle, which is essentially averaging them all. Uh, and then you can see BCPT, it's taken a bit of benchmark risk with conviction to London. Uh, and it's, uh, it's delivered some outperformance as a result. But what you can really see that the story here is the variance in between the sectors. Um, and 15 years ago, this would look very, very different because those sector fundamentals are evolving all the time. And so you've got to keep abreast of those and you've got to be allocating the capital accordingly. So, I mean, the standout one, very much, very uh, top right, is uh, industrial. Obviously, they've been a, a stellar performer in recent years. Um, and we've seen some really successful single strategies in that in that space. It's where a lot of diversified, including us, have gone for the uh, have gone for performance. Um, it's really gone from strength to strength. You've had online retailing, where that that is taking a bit of a backseat at the moment, strengthening it. But you've also got onshoring, manufacturing. You've got supply chain resilience coming through. As a result, as John's already mentioned, we've seen vacancy rates fall to sort of sub four percent, and they're pretty sticky at those levels. Um, and so we've seen rental growth over ten percent. And that's mean there's been a lot of capital going into the sector sparing capital growth, which was kind of 30% plus in 2021. Um, again, the flip side of that was your, your yields were compressing. And um, so when we had the yield expansion late last year, you saw industrial yields blow out by 160 basis points. And you saw 30% plus growth turn to negative 17 uh, in 2022. So what that meant was you had a bit of variability. Now this measures upside and downside variability. So it's a bit of both. And if you aggregate the two, frankly, the capital return is still very strong. But the point remains that your yields were being compressed. And so therefore in a diversified strategy, you can rely on other elements of your portfolio to support that, like retail warehousing primarily for us. Um, retail has been, uh, it's had a challenging couple of years, I think it's fair to say, but um, and there's been a lot of, lot of change. As we saw, it's, it's featured ever ever less within diversified portfolios. Um, it really fell out of, fell out of favour in sort of mid 2010s when you had a lot of CVAs, you had a lot of uh, growth in online sales, um, and that really affected performance at the time, albeit supported by industrials on the flip side. Um, but what we've seen more recently is because you had all that yield decompression, there was then a lot of yield defence built into the sector. So when the yields when all when all yields expanded last year. You have retail offering you relative capital resilience as well as an attractive income return. So again, it, it could act as a, a, an effective foil against your industrials. Um, and going back kind of five years or so, um, it really was kind of all sectors within retail were pretty toxic. Um, you had, but now you've got online sales increasing. You've actually got retailers withdrawing online platforms. Um, you've got the pure play struggling a little bit. So retail is, is having a bit of a renaissance. And if we look at BCPT, the biggest uh, asset in their portfolio is in Christmas Place in central London, which is a mixed use retail led estate. And that had a really tough time through the pandemic. Um, but over the last 12 months, it's very much in a recovery phase. And it's been the asset uh, portfolio strong, uh, strongest performing asset over the last 12 months. And while the wider market was delivering negative capital growth, negative total returns, St. Christopher's Place, being a large retail holding, was delivering positives on both. Um, so you have seen some, uh, some real defense come back into the sector. And what you've also had is a kind of sorting of the tenant base in that you've had a lot of failures. So a lot of the weaker tenants have fallen out of the market. And that means you're left with a relatively resilient tenant base now. So you can start looking into the sub-market. So rather than just retail as a whole being lumped together, you've got convenience neighborhood retailing where you've now got very strong occupational fundamentals because you've got people in a hybrid work environment shopping more locally. Uh, and as Joanne has already mentioned, retail warehousing has really become a bit of a, a bit of a darling of the sector in that it's, it's transitioned from uh, sort of fashion-led lineup, chasing high rents over to a sort of discount convenience-led lineup where you've got strong covenants paying you uh, sustainable rent. And they're using these stores as part of a, an omni retail platform. Um, so this is a far more sustainable model. And if you now look at the retail warehousing market, you've got vacancy rates sub 5%, so comparable to industrials, but you've got a 100 basis point yield premium from the sector. So again, within a diversified portfolio, you can get the 
low yield, uh, low yielding but high growth industrials. You can counterbalance that with the high yielding uh, retail warehousing. Um, offices, uh, they're right there in the middle. I mean, they they are still very much relevant. I mean, we shouldn't reach back to the site. They are the most traded sector still. They were for 2022. They are in the first part of 20, uh, 2023 as well. But they are very much in an evolution. I mean, you would have had a lot about bifurcation in the sector, and it's, it's very much true in the you've got the secondary end of the market where you're struggling to get occupiers. Uh, you've got ESG uh, concerns coming through. And then you've got the right buildings in the right locations where you can invest and you can see that back in the capital return. So there's very much a, a flight to quality still still playing out. And perhaps the secondary end of the market, so there's some more pain to come there if you've got overexposure. But the prime end, um, it's, uh, it, it's moving on quite well. I mean, you look at the West End, for instance, you've got take up in Q1 is up. 90% uh, plus of that is focused on the prime end of the market. And so you've seen prime rents moving on. So there's definitely still a, a, a place for offices within a diversified portfolio. Um, lastly, I'll just touch quickly on alternatives. You can see they've uh, they've really come to feature more heavily in the diversified portfolio. And within the last 15 years, they've really risen to prominence and they, they're delivering outperformance, but it's significantly less volatility than you get from the wider market. And I'll touch on these a bit later, but that's because they're really supported by strong demographic drivers. So you've got some counter-cyclical resilience coming through. But I suppose the, the kind of evolution there is, is the rise of the sector itself. I mean, when we set up BCPT in early to, uh, 2000, um, the, we've now had to go and change our investment restrictions to allow us to, to invest more into the uh, alternatives because they just weren't factored into the commercial real estate market at the time. So I suppose the key point to make is that uh, real estate is there as a, firstly, as a long-term hold. It's there to deliver you a, a risk premium. And it's there to be less volatile than equities or, or, or bonds. Obviously, there's been some, some challenges around that recently. But um, as we go into a new environment, I think retail, uh, real estate is going to be there to do what, what it's supposed to do. I mean, you've now got interest rates of 4.5%, uh, which is in line with long-term averages. We've had very loose monetary policy for 10 years or so, which has meant the, the risk premium for real estate has expanded. And that means you've had some capital over exuberance, like you've seen in those slides that Joanna mentioned. Um, but now you've got a risk premium following the repricing of 200, 250 basis points, which again is in line with long term averages. So from that, you can think that actually capital isn't really going to be a driver going forward. It's going to be your income. And that's where, where real estate comes in. It's delivering you a stable, growing income stream with a bit of capital appreciation as well to deliver the outperformance. Um, so going forwards, I mean, this will continue to evolve. But what we're going to see is the rise of the sectors that can firstly deliver a stable income return, but also a growing one. So you're looking at something like industrial, where we've had 10% growth, we've got another 3 to 5% per annum coming through. You've got retail warehousing, where you're getting a yield premium, plus there's another 1% or 2%, and, and I think it was yesterday, British Land up their, uh, up their forecast to 2 to 3% per annum come from the retail warehousing market. Um, and then you've got student housing, is probably the other one, um, probably the main alternative to pick out. You know, that's delivering in the wide markets, 5 to 7% per annum rental growth. So that's going to be a bedrock of returns going forward. Um, but then on top of that, we've seen in Q1 value stabilised. So March saw the first improvements in the, the monthly valuation index. And now what we'll see, what we're beginning to see is these sectors that can drive income, they're beginning to compress. So we're seeing a little bit of uh, a little bit of capital growth coming through on top of those income profiles as well. And so if income is going to be the driver for us, uh, Really, what we need to be focusing on is that is asset management. So that's going to be a key differentiator over the uh, over the coming period because it's not just your sector allocations; it's, it's how you can sweat your assets, um, and that's where the question of core versus core plus comes in. I mean, this is effectively a uh, a measure of where an asset is within its life cycle. So a core asset will give you probably a steady income um, stream, but perhaps not much opportunity to go in and make interventions to try and deliver some outperformance. Uh, Core Plus on the other side gives you something to go at and, and potentially drip, driving some outperformance through active management of that building. Um, so as we're coming to a period of hopefully more stable returns, slightly more benign return environment, then this is going to be really important to minimise your voids, maximise your income. It's particularly true in industrials where you've had that 10% growth, you've got more to come and you've got to capture that. So you've got to take those market dynamics and you've actually got to capture it through your asset management. And so I've put up an example here from, uh, from Liverpool. This is the spec development we did did last year. And just to outline the strength of the market, we went to best bids with uh, three occupiers a couple of weeks ago, got rent ahead of ERV. And so that means you don't only move on your rent, but you're also getting capital appreciation through that as well. Um, retail warehousing, um, 
that has yeah really gone from strength to strength recently. And the main attraction is that you've got that yield premium. But the question is, you've got to be able to maintain that yield premium because we have seen failures, you've seen vacancies in the wrong place, you've seen transition from fashion over to discount. So what we've got here is uh, Newby Retail Park and Sears Retail Park and Solihulls. These are two big prime schemes where we've gone through that that transition towards discount grocery. And you're seeing a lot more sales growth coming through those sectors. You're seeing a lot more footfall being driven. And as a result, all the space on both of these parks was taken up in the second half of last year. So that underpins your income, but it also kind of speaks to the investment thesis for the for the wider sector. Um, I thought I'd include an office example here because it, it, it's really very stock dependent in the office sector. And um, you've got to be able to actively manage your, your buildings. You've got to be able to invest in them to keep them to the right specification. Um, to then get the occupied demand, drive your rents on, and then you get that all back in the capital. And, and I'll put up an example from Burton Lane. So this is in the city. So it's a good quality building, core location. Um, we've just speculatively refurbed two floors in there, um, move the EPCs on from Ds to Bs, which is really important in future proofing your building, both for you and, and occupiers. And then we've got both of those floors away at, at strong rents, and we're seeing all that back in the capital value. So it's just, a, it really is a question of, uh, of picking your time within that market, making a call on an asset when it's perhaps comes to the end of its asset, uh, of its life cycle. Lastly, I'll just touch on, uh, on the alternative sector. I mean, yeah, it's 15 years ago, this made up about 5% of the index. It's now the best part of 27, I think, percent, was it? Um, and it really is quite a wide sector. Um, the biggest sectors are the most mature will be student and uh, hotels. But I mean, you can see the list there. It's, it's, it's very, very nuanced. But the reason why it's come to prominence and the reason why it has a role in, in a diversified portfolio is it's supported by strong demographic drivers. As a result, it behaves quite differently to a lot of the more traditional sectors. Um, so that gives it some uh, kind of counter cyclical qualities um, that you can rely on when, when, others are, when others are struggling, as you saw on the, uh, on the variation slide earlier. So some of the structural trends you can look at, things like aging population, that's impact on healthcare and later living. Uh, rise of further education, and particularly in more challenging economic climates like we're in a minute, you see more people going through further education. And um, the COVID pandemic, the impact that's had on life sciences, which has been a real, real winner in recent years, and the housing shortage for self-storage and for BTR. So they're very well supported structurally, but they also offer you an income return in that, an, an income advantage in that they generally offer you inflation hedging income from a lot of these sectors. So that's why they've increasingly become part of the uh, the diversified portfolio but speaking to to the benefits of diversification and not without risks I and mean, then has already mentioned the regulatory risk but these are also operational businesses so they're quite specialized so you need to have quite a sophisticated underwriter to really be certain in what you're investing in frankly but all of this just comes back to the fact that you need to be able to rely on a manager or someone to make the right sector calls uh, the right asset calls when you're getting to the end of market cycles or asset in your portfolio so you can deliver that, that outperformance over a long-term basis. That brings me to kind of the end of our presentation. Um, I put up here a couple of key takeaways. Um, we've spoken to all of them um, and hopefully that's left some time for questions if anyone has any. Hey. Retail warehousing only 12%, I say only because I don't know if that's a fair comment to say only, but uh, you wouldn't go higher or have decided not to. Uh, we would go higher. Yeah, we would. I mean, at the minute, we're looking at down weighting on, on offices towards industrial, towards retail housing, uh, warehousing, because, yeah, I think there's there's a lot more to come from that sector. I mean, everyone's, there's growth expected to come through and the tenant base there is is robust. And so we think, oh, there's a long-term bet. It's very strong, I think. The other thing that retail warehousing has is it has really, really good ESG benefits in that it's, you've got big roofs, so you can put solar up there. So you can you can really help drive your uh, your net zero carbon agenda through the sector as well. So we'd definitely like to see more allocation there. Oh, hey. I, you mentioned that the West End um, revenue was in, increasing rents. Um, City, have, have, what's your view on the future city properties? Because an awful lot of them are probably under-occupied rather than empty. Yeah. I, Where I, does that move the market? Yeah, I think the West End has, has done substantially better than the city. We've seen yield decompression in the city. We're seeing vacancy rates rising in the city as well. 
Um, you will have noted perhaps on the sector allocation, we've only got we've only got one building in the city. Um, so that that part of the market is more difficult. It comes back to having the right buildings because I mean Birchin Lane is a city asset, so you've got the right thing in the right place. You can still drive that drive performance from it because that asset for us over the last couple of months has delivered income, capital, and total outperformance. Um, just because you you can make the right interventions to keep it relevant. But uh, yeah, the the West End is certainly outperformed. So there are some very big buildings in the city that are probably not untenanted but underutilised by the people that um, occupy them. I think fundamentally they, they will struggle. I mean, there's no getting away from it. Not, not everything can be rosy. And I do think particularly the single tenanted large buildings probably struggle to, to be able to even if they're a very good quality to get some tenancy I think you're going to see some drops of rent I don't know. <laughs> yeah absolutely I think they will struggle I mean we've got a building it's not in the city but it, it talks that it's an old HQ building um out in Stockley Park um and that is essentially a, a repositioning plan so we're going to be looking at alternative uses on that because you can drive higher value through uh, be it data centre, be it healthcare use, something like that, you can drive higher values than you can. Do you think they'll be repurposed rather than? I think a number will will have to be repurposed. Yeah. What we are though seeing in the city is is a scaling back of the parking lot. Right? There was well, so that it doesn't. It's not the answer, but it's it's definitely one of the things that will help. We're not building as much as we built before, and I think actually one of the reasons the vacancy across the sectors over time since the GFC is relatively stable at, at an average level is because we didn't have a lot of open building after GSC. The pipelines basically didn't in London got wiped out. There wasn't any debt financing for it. People didn't build. Um, so so with, the, with the next kind of downturn in the market, for example, we were in at least a better position, not a great position, but a better position. So um, I'm a glass half full person. I think it could have been a lot worse <laughs> but, than it is now. Um, but, but I think there is, there is yeah, there is going to be a little bit of pain for the period of the city. Also, the um, when you talk about diversification and alternatives, where does healthcare come into that sector? As I saw it on the board, but like, what type of healthcare are you investing in? What type of investments are are you talking about specifically? Yeah, I mean, we we personally aren't invested in in healthcare. I mean, you've got primary healthcare and you've got secondary healthcare, which is essentially uh hospitals and doctors facilities and, and within within the broader healthcare sector as well you can look at things like um supported living um as well that, that sometimes falls under the, the healthcare bracket it was just um one of the online questions uh was uh, what impact will regulation on epcs have on the portfolio and do you ever feel for the costs of uh, bringing the assets up to standard yeah, I mean, that's that's one we get quite regularly. I mean, I think part of it is that actually just by owning real estate, you are you're recycling your assets, you're investing in them, you're moving them on just just in the asset life cycle. So a lot of that just gets wrapped up in the day to day management of a building. Um, also, a lot of this is dealt with by by tenants. They take on take on a lot of that liability when they're when they're fitting out their buildings. But there is there is definitely a liability there. And it's something that I think the market is looking at very, very closely. You can, because um, there's also on top of that, you've got the net zero carbon agenda coming through. So everyone is plotting out how their net zero carbon is going to come through. So there are going to be some capital liabilities there, but I think a lot of it is wrapped up in the ordinary life cycle of an asset. Um, I think you covered to some extent that there was a, a question regarding the office weightings and uh, what you saw as the future of that sector, given the change in flexible working patterns. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think I've already touched on it very briefly, but I think we will be down weighting towards the office to the office market. Um, uh, as we've said, I think there are there are assets that are there are markets and there are assets that you can be invested in and they can deliver you performance, but it's the secondary end of the market, it's the regional secondary holdings that uh, that we will be um, not looking to, to invest in. I think one thing just to say about offices as well is, um, I think it's probably had headlines recently quite similar to where retail was you know, a few years ago when the house was dead and all the rest of it, well, no, it isn't. Uh, it's different, but I think with offices, it's it really, a lot of companies are still going through what they think is the solution for them. 
and a lot of companies don't know what the answer is yet. Um, I think uh, generally there will be, there is a structural change, obviously, and we will have less office space, we will need less office space, but companies haven't yet figured out. There isn't one size that fits all. And I think we're still on that evolution and on that journey. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount them, but I think they need to be looked at. And I'm, I'm concerned on that secondary offices will be harder. Um, there definitely is a push to like to quality, location is key. Do they offer ESG credentials, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think there's still a case for offices, but it's probably not as strong as it might have been. But again, it's still the biggest, the biggest traded sector um, in, in sort of investment volumes terms. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you very much.